Welcome everyone to the webinar, Beyond Farmers and Micro-Entrepreneurs, Why Rural Wage Labor Matters. We're really thrilled to have you join us for what we feel is a really incredibly important topic that's really at the forefront of our economic development work. My name is Anna Garlock. I'm the Component Manager for the Pathways Out of Poverty Track for the USAID-funded Leveraging Economic Opportunities Project, which is implemented by ACDI VOCA. As part of our efforts to research and learn about what drives poverty reduction through markets, we launched an initiative uh, at the beginning of this year around labor and poverty, and one of our first outputs is the report that you will hear more about today. We're really pleased to be hosting this webinar in collaboration with the Beam Exchange and the Seep Network's Market Facilitation, or MAFI, uh, working group. And I'm also happy to have Lucho Osorio, the Inclusive Market Systems Specialist at Beam Exchange and coordinator of Seep's MAFI group, join us as well. With that, I will hand it over to Bernd Mueller. Uh, Bernd is a labor economist with FAO's Decent Rural Employment Team. He has also served as, uh, and currently serves as, an advisor to Leo's labor work, and he was the lead author of this evidence review on wage labor, wage labor, agricultural economies, and pathways out of poverty. With that, I will hand it over to, to you, Bernd. Thank you very much, Anna. And, um, well, thanks for having me, and, and, and thanks, everyone, for joining us for this webinar. Um, as Anna said, we're trying to explore some of these issues, uh, which you will find in the report that Anna mentioned, and um, um, really explore some of these. Uh, we will not, probably not be able to provide all the answers. This is really just at the start of, of this activity. Um, but but uh, it seems that this might be something of a lot of interest for many people, and then so hopefully we can explore some of these issues together. So to start with, I thought we could have uh, a little poll. And thanks, Kristen, for putting up on the right-hand side. Um, I was interested to, to hear what you feel what your main group of beneficiaries are in your work. And then please answer on the right-hand side in the poll that you can see there. Uh, the options are the following. A, are the benef your benef main group of beneficiaries smallholder farmers? B, micro-entrepreneurs? C, medium to large-scale businesses? D, agricultural workers? E, non-agricultural workers? F, unpaid family workers? G, unemployed? Or maybe H, any others? I would be grateful if you can provide your answer. Let's, let's define beneficiaries loosely. So even if you're academics, maybe the main group of concern of your work. All right, thank you very much. I'm trying to see the results there. So the overwhelming majority, and I'm not very surprised if you said uh, smallholder farmers, uh, and then the next uh, um, group was micro-entrepreneurs, with all the other options being far behind. And this probably is not coming as a surprise. Um, if we look at market development approaches, uh, like this one that I'm showing here on this slide, which is the main USAID market systems development framework, a lot of these are really geared towards farmers and, and, and micro-entrepreneurs. Um, the point, they can be through different mechanisms, both indirect or, or very direct, but very commonly these focus on these two groups, farmers and entrepreneurs, often, of course, with the goal of, of poverty reduction. The question is, why do we do that? Uh, what are the, our region, rationales behind that? What's the theory of change behind that? And might we not be missing out some groups? Um, often this is based on widely accepted facts. This one I found in The Guardian very recently. It says, most of the world's poorest people are subsistence farmers. Just uh, late last year, this was for a live q and in The Guardian. Um, a background gap paper for the recent World Development Report on jobs said agricultural wage income, income is very low and 
This is because of the thinness of agricultural wage labor markets. These are very common statements, and, and I'm sure all of you are quite familiar with them. And often they're held as facts. Now the question is, are these really facts? The thing is that specialized labor market service tell us a very, very different story. And, and, and this might um, uh, give reason to question these, these, let's say, stereotypical facts. For example, we have this study on the left, which was done in Ethiopia and Uganda with a large randomized sample of, of men, rural men, men and women. And in the past 12 months, it gives a percentage of people who work for wage labor in either the coffee, the flowers, or the tea sector in both of these countries. And generally, the answer is between 40 and 60 percent. And again, this is a large sample with, um, uh, 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 with, of high representativity. Another case study in Tanzania, uh, a bit smaller this, but also randomized, found that, especially of the poorest quintile on the right, Q5 on this graph, 65% of their income was derived from casual wage incomes in rural areas in that country. So this really runs very contrary to these stylized facts that I showed earlier. So there's a bit of a disconnect. And these really are, this is the background of the report that we are, um, were, were working on earlier this year, and which has just recently come out. Um, so I, would, I want to talk around this a bit and then explore some of these issues. Where is this disconnect? Why do we have these um, slightly diverging opinions, maybe? On the right-hand side, you also see an infographic there. Um, we will provide the links to all, both of these later at the end of the presentation. So running through the presentation, first of all, I would like to talk about the terminology behind this then a bit about the statistics um, that we have on labor markets, um, then really going a bit more in the stock taking and the ev evidence, what do we know about the work of the poor, and, and afterwards a bit more into dynamic issues over time, where to for rural labor markets, these are issues of structural transformation and so on. And then the final part, we want to move on a bit more and talk about implications for our work, uh, what sort of conclusions we have, what really makes a difference for workers uh, in, in poor rural areas. Let's start with the first. If you look at this lady, what are we actually seeing? Or what, what, what's, who do we think uh, is there working in this maize field? Is she a farmer? Is she an unpaid family worker? Or is she in fact a wage worker? And what would usually be our first assumption? And also, how can we tell the difference? Of course, just by looking at her, just by mere observation, we cannot tell the difference. And we need to distinguish that because she might just as well be a wage worker and not a farmer. How can we tell the difference? Well, it is really important to make this quite clear because this has a lot of implications for um, the, the underlying incentive structure of people working in rural areas. It all re revolves around the ownership of the means of production, so the ownership of the land, the capital, the assets, or the tools. Wage workers do not own these means of production. So if this woman, for example, would be working on somebody else's land, she would be a wage worker. Of course, if she's tilling her own land, she would be defined as a self-employed worker, a farmer, an own account farmer. Why is this important? Well, this has a big impact on our work and then the incentive structures that this woman might be um, um, uh, reacting to. So if you consider the standard rural development tools, input subsidies, irrigation systems, extension services, microcredits, uh, maybe better agriculture prices, how do they, these uh, interventions have an in impact on this woman if she is a wage worker rather than an own account farmer, a self-employed worker. So this really lies at the core of, of um, this question about wage work and why I really should uh, think carefully about it. And this not, doesn't only go for agriculture, this goes for every type of occupation. How do we know which of these people that you see on these pictures are in fact wage workers or self-employed? And the answer, of course, they could be either, all of them. 
And again, it depends on the ownership of the means of production. If you see the Bajaj driver in Ethiopia on the top left, does this person own the Bajaj he's driving or is he driving for someone else? And that really makes a big difference for how we might be able to, to help him out. So, moving on, um, I, uh, what do we know about labor markets, labor markets and, and data? Um, these are national labor statistics that you see on the left there. Um, these are derived usually from national surveys, be it, for example, the ILO's labor for surveys or large-scale household surveys like the World Bank's living standards measure measurement studies. And they give a very common picture. In Tanzania, 11% of rural households include at least one, at least one wage worker. In Uganda, a very similar figure, 11% of women work for wages in agriculture. In Ethiopia, 7.9% of, to of the total labor force, both urban and rural, are wage employed, and so on and so forth. Now, if you compare them with case study evidence, specialized surveys that really look into the labor market that have a much more in-depth method methodology, um, you get a very different picture. So if you contrast these figures, Tanzania, suddenly these studies say 58% of households not just 11, 58% of households include at least one wage worker. In Uganda, 45% of all women sampled work for wages, and so on and so forth. So there's a huge disconnect there. And by the way, these are not small studies necessarily. They're both small and large studies, but they are based on randomized samples. Uh, the question is, where is this difference coming from? Certainly what we can find, and we found that in the report, is there's a systematic underreporting of rural wage labor in these national statistics. This has a huge impact of our perception of uh, rural economies and it has a huge impact on how we might approach our whole work. Now, what are the reasons for the low data quality? A lot of it, and I cannot go into much detail here for time reasons, it lies in survey design. How we ask questions to what people and in what way. Um, I explore, or we explore this a bit more in the report, but there are a lot of problems with survey design. Let's, let me give you just one ex practical example. This data you see here in this table is from the, um, again, the World Bank's LSMS surveys. It says in Ghana and in Nigeria, 8 and 4% respectively uh, engage in rural wage employment. But in Malawi, the same type of survey suddenly reveals there's 39%. Now, what's the difference between the rural economies of Malawi and the other countries? In all likelihood, this has something to do that only the Malawian questionnaire actually included the local term for casual wage employment, for Ganyu in this case, and the others didn't. They asked for regular jobs, and so uh, this type of work was not captured. So this really tells you that we have to be very careful uh, with these sort of statistics. Now, what that aside, what do we know about the work of the poor. The first thing is um, diversification. That's, that is probably something that all of you are quite familiar um, of and with, and, and that is very common across the world. Um, rural livelihood diversica diversification and participation in rural non-farm activities. The problem is this is really just saying that most people are doing many different things, not just farming, but it really doesn't give us much detail. And the question of well, one finding of these studies looking into diversification say that diversity can be both for survival, like a, a, me, um, a way to, to make ends meet, or diversity for accumulation. But it's very difficult to tell the difference. If you look a bit deeper, you will find that self-employed non-farm activities are actually much more important for better off households because they have the capital that allows them to invest in small businesses um, or in, in other activities and accumulate on that basis. On the other hand, for the poorest households, you find that they really rely very heavily on mostly casual or seasonal wage work, both in agriculture and beyond, of course. And this really is important to see that, especially for the poorest, wage work is incredibly important. And there are many examples of this, and I'm sure all of you have seen this sort of work uh, 
when you've visited rural areas, be it in Africa, but also Asia and beyond. This could be seasonal agricultural work, often harvesting, but also processing. Um, a lot of it is in construction and mining and so on and so forth. Uh, very often you have, for example, domestic servants who might be mistaken for family members because maybe distant family members, but in fact they are wage workers. This is a very common scenario. So there's a lot of so-called hidden wage labor uh, in rural areas. Now, it's very important to acknowledge that all of these different sectors can actually have relatively good and very relatively bad um, working conditions. So just by saying it's agricultural labor or it's construction labor doesn't tell us anything whether it's good or whether it's bad. And all this at the same time also, all these different uh, types of wage labor can be both for survival, just to make ends meet, or as a means to get out of poverty. So what really is important is that context is key in these uh, circumstances. Beyond that, there are certain other issues, and then you, of course, have heard many of them. First is gender. It really is really important in labor market studies, um, both in terms of uh, unpaid family work, domestic work, which often goes unenumerated, uh, but also sp special activities which um, are much more accessible to m women and can really become, uh, um, let's say, uh, promising way out of poverty, like, for example, these coffee sorters in Ethiopia or in the flower industry. This is an, that's another good example where the labor force is uh, in the majority female. Age is really important. And here we're looking both at the problem of youth unemployment, which is becoming more and more important and, and, and is defining national agendas very much, but also the other scale of em employment, the one that, of course, none of us really want to see, is child labor. So this is really important to, to, to take into account as well. Work of the elderly would be another age issue that often goes unaddressed. And migration, both internal but also international migration, very hot topic at the moment as well. Uh, if you look at this picture of coffee uh, harvest workers who've just been um, transported in on lorries, who live often in very rudimentary um, accommodation, labor camps, and then are often also very vulnerable because they're not... Uh, well embedded in the respective communities. So also their problems or their concerns need to be addressed. To give you a be better picture, maybe in terms of statistics um, for Africa, as I said, relating to the earlier study that I mentioned, Tanzania, especially for the poorest households, 65% of their annual income comes from casual wage work. Um, a government survey in Ghana found that 59% of cocoa workers a often so-called smallholder crop, are in fact by-day workers, daily workers, and they're described by that same survey as living from hand to mouth, so they're very poor. Similar picture in Nigeria, where another study found that especially the poorer, in the, or the poorer household gets, the more reliant and the more that household would participate in agriculture wage employment. And finally, this does not just... Um, include landless households. Uh, in Malawi, national statistics show us that even for smallholder households, so farming households, the second largest contributor to household income with 23% is wage work. So it's really too important to also differentiate here between different types of workers, but also different activities. So many uh, workers can do um, different activities at different times of the year and be self-employed at one point and wage employed at another. In Asia, we see similar pictures. Um, this, these statistics from India show also, again, the huge reliance for um, poor households, rural households, on wage labor, and respectively, how it's actually the richer households who rely much more on self-employment. So, and then these figures, actually, the self-employment figures, the, the majority of which uh, are agriculture, so farming. But again, this shows that maybe there's a misconception that poor households really rely on self-employment, which is really not the case. Um, in China, we find a slightly changing um, situation where wage employment is actually associated with rising prosperity, people moving from the rural areas to the cities to get paid jobs, and that is a real um, sense of, of prosperity to get out of poverty and then a real 
sign of structural transformation that is, of, of course, happening in the country. Which brings me to the next topic. Um, how do labor markets evolve? And then staying with China, uh, you can see that there are very common trends. And then they probably at the moment are the most uh, obvious or visible in China, where the rural working population has been declining very quickly over the past years. And at the same time, agricultural labor productivity has risen sharply. And for the economists of you out there, um, of course, uh, labor productivity is closely linked with wage, wages. And then in, indeed, that report, Wiggins and Keaton and ODI report, has shown how rural wages in Asia have risen sharply in that period. In Africa, the picture is a bit different, and many people are saying, actually, there is no, isn't that much transformation happening, although there's rapid growth. Um, there can be debates about this. Um, surely, it depends very much on the country context. For, for example, if you look at Ethiopia, um, certainly there's a lot of transformation happening. Be that as it may, in the long run, it's very clear that also this process will Will, will proceed in some form or another, and labor will more and more be released from small-scale agriculture. Either way, it is very clear that wage labor becomes more important over time, and certainly not less so. One part of this is, of course, migration. And then, in fact, migration can be seen as a cornerstone of economic upward mobility. Let me give you another example from Tanzania, a very interesting study um, that tracked households over time. It did two surveys, one in 91 and then another one 13 years later in 2004, comparing households and then where they have been after this period of where they are after this period of 13 years. And what it found consistently is, first of all, all of those who moved out of the original rural com community have had benefited most and they have increased their expenditure, consumption expenditure much more than the others. But also, very interestingly, it showed that those who stayed in agriculture, and especially those who moved back into agriculture, um, were not able to profit as much. And then, especially those who stayed behind and moved into agriculture, lost out over time. So this tells you a lot uh, about pathways out of poverty and how they are increasingly labor market-based, be it through migration or not. But it also tells us something about rural urban linkages and so on and so forth. Um, the question now really is how can we in our work support this process? And this brings me to the next point, the next section in the presentation. To lighten things up, let's try and find an answer to this together. What do you think, let's have another poll, what do you think is most likely the highest priority for poor rural wage workers. So please let's have another poll on, on the right hand side. What do you think is the most likely most likely the highest priority for poor rural wage workers? Is it a job security, i.e. a more stable job, safer work, i.e. work that is less dangerous, more work also across seasons, shorter working hours, uh, might it be better pay, better social protection or insurance, Maybe it's less discrimination, or it might be more labor rights, including freedom of association or collective bargaining. Um, if I may ask Kristen to put on that poll on the right, please, and then I would be interested to hear your answers to this. Thank you. All right, thanks. I cannot see the results. Can you maybe display them for me? Ah, thanks very much. So, the clear majority of you, 33% said it's better pay. Uh, the next one was 17% was more work. And after that, 13 14% uh, of you said it might be 
job security? Well, thank you very much, first of all. The answer to this, of course, it depends. And it brings us to the question, what, and I will come back to, to the results in a, in a minute. It, it brings up the question, what is a good and what is a bad job? And the answer, it depends on the actual context of poverty. Now, for us, it may, may be very clear that a good job is a safe job, a job that gives us a reasonable income, maybe some, secur uh, some security and safety, and, then, and so on and so forth. Now, for a very poor and desperate person, that might be very different. And actually, any job that is actually relatively bad might have a really positive impact for that person, even though it is work that we might not characterize as being decent. But especially for the most destitute, having any job can actually make the difference for survival. The question is, how do we address this in our work? Of course, the ILO has uh, brought forward the idea of decent work and the, the ultimate goal of decent work for all, which is fair and square. But I think it's very important that this is being pursued gradually, not as an uh, yes or no standard, but uh, like an ultimate goal that we can work towards. And it's very important that this is being pursued with a lot of context awareness. What, of course, is very important here is that there must be a bottom line. And it's very clear that we should never, ever promote the worst types of jobs. Um, work that is directly harmful to the worker, that might be forced labor, and especially the worst forms of child labor. So, of course, there's a bottom line here, and we cannot say that any bad job might be good enough or anything like that, far from it. But, of course, we have to differentiate. And that's the point I'm trying to bring across here. Now, on the micro level, what type of labor improvements have, and this results again from the stock taking report that we've done, based on the evidence that we have, what sort of improvements are important for workers? And it's, um, in, your, in the poll that we've done, uh, you've got it quite right, actually. Um, the, for all workers, of course, the increased pay and the increased wages is very important, but first and foremost, also the quantity of work and the seasonal distribution of work. So having enough work to get by. What is also important for every worker out there is, of course, improved access to social protection in case something happens, in case uh, uh, so that in case they they have to exit the job market or anything, so that they are covered. Now, beyond that, it is really important to acknowledge that there's much more nuance. And again, it really depends on the type of poverty situation that a household is in. We've done this in the report, and I cannot go into much detail here, but it also relates to issues of occupational health and safety. And I would like to encourage all of you to please have a look at that. Um, this table, for example, you find, uh, if I'm not mistaken, on page 44 on the report, and then in the text around it, you will find much more nuance, and it's really important that this is taken into account. But also on the macro level, important labor market improvements can be brought about. One really important, let's say, principal rule should be about tightening labor markets. What do I mean by that? Tightening labor markets basically means reducing the gap between labor supply and labor demand. Usually a big problem in rural labor markets in poor countries is that there's a huge oversupply of labor, uh, at least over the year. Even if there's seasonal shortages over the, the whole of the year, uh, there's an oversupply, and mainly because people are too poor not to work. And this is any policy, any intervention that can reduce this gap will in principle have a driving effect, an upward effect on wages and working conditions and so on. So this should always be a guiding principle of any work that we do, trying to tighten the labor market in order to improve conditions. Um, what also is important is to look at the structure of the sector, the value chain or the market system that we work in. And then many uh, different factors can play in, there, in here. Um, any value chain that is employment intensive uh, of course, will have bigger impacts. It is also to look, important to look at linkages between different sectors. For example, if we have large employment effects in one sector, this might reduce labor supply in another sector, also having important positive effects there. Or we could look at remittances. So if we have rising incomes in one sector, that might be re remitted to another sector like agriculture and be reinvested there. So these should really be looked at. Also, 
we should be clear that scale is really important when we come to employment. Uh, on average, larger employers tend to have better employment conditions overall, and also employers who uh, are in higher value chain, higher value production tend to have better employment. Of course, this is not a guarantee, but in tendency, this is an important thing to consider. Education, of course, is very important in various ways, both directly to equip people with the means to get into the labor market, but also indirectly. If you think again of the tightening labor markets, uh, the, the principle of tightening labor markets, if we bring children into school, that means that we take them out of the labor market, especially in contexts where there's a lot of child labor. Uh, that labor has to be replaced, hopefully, by a paid adult worker. So these are very important effects in, in improving labor market outcomes. Again, in all of these, it is really important to, to be aware of the context in which we are working. And then in different contexts and countries and sectors, different outcomes might be achieved. So bringing this to a close, what can we take away from it? Linking it again with the title of the presentation, why does rural wage labor matter? Well, first of all, as I said at the back, wage labor is hugely underestimated and underacknowledged. Really, the, this is a key takeaway, both from the report and I hope also for you from, from this presentation, because it's something that maybe most people are not aware of. In fact, it has been estimated that over 40% of the agricultural workforce are wage workers. Now, this becomes even more important if we think of the poorest households, especially the poorest heavily depend on wage income, mainly because they don't have, for example, the, the capital to invest or the land to, to be farmers. And then this wage work is both for survival and for part of ways out of poverty. And I think both of these functions are really important. So we shouldn't just look at the latter, but also the first. So any form of wage work can have an important function for these poor households. Any sort of improvements in the quantity and the quality of jobs can have a huge impact towards ending mass poverty, exactly for this reason. And then, again, this should be a key takeaway. And this is why, and then if we look at issues of structural transformation and so on, wage labor is becoming clearly more important over time, not less so. What does that mean for our work concretely? Now, bringing again up this, di uh, this, this um, graph of the uh, markets, USA's labor uh, market system, sorry, market systems development approach. Surely, if we take on board these lessons about labor markets, this has a huge impact of how we work, of our theories of change, how we address different elements within market systems, and so on and so forth. Uh, in order to also capture wage labor and then reduce uh, poverty from that angle. Now, of course, uh, I don't have the, all the answers yet, and then this should be part of the, the ongoing discussion both today but also in the coming e-consultation, and I will tell you a bit more about that later. But an initial take that we took from the uh, stock-taking report is that, first of all, if we want to look at poverty reduction, at resilience, at food security, we cannot just look at farmers and entrepreneurship. We really need to take into account wage incomes and jobs. Otherwise, we would lose out a huge chunk of the poor. So that means we need to actively include and, if possible, focus on wage workers as our key beneficiary group. And if you look at the poll that I did at the very beginning, probably most of us aren't yet doing that. So this is something we should think about. Um, in order to be able to do that, we should be aware of this consistent underreporting of wage labor in the statistics, and we need to be aware of the context. One intervention might work very well in one particular context and sector and might work very different in another one. So it is very important that we have, especially since the statistics and the data is not there, it's very important that we do careful assessments and labor market assessments in our work. Beyond that, we really should focus on initiatives that increase the quantity of work and then have a tightening effect on the labor markets, as I explained. And for that, we need to choose the right systems, the right value change that can have this large wage employment potential and impact. And there we should not only look at particular singular value chains, but also at the linkages between systems and value chains. Finally, 
We should, of course, contribute to improving working conditions as much as we can and wherever we can. This might be uh, raising the pay, but also uh, better occupational safe and healthy uh, um, occupational health and safety measures, um, or, the, or improving social protection initiatives. And a specific effort should be placed on the labor issues faced by women, youth, and migrant workers. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Please have a look at the report. And of course, um, I'm looking forward to your questions and to the discussions. And from there, I'll hand it back to Anna. Thanks, thanks, Bernd. Um, I, we're going to get to some Q&A in just a moment. So um, please feel free to type um, some questions or even comments, reflections um, into the Q&A box there at the bottom right-hand side of your screen. I do just want to um, quickly highlight here the link to the report um, is microlinks.org slash Leo Wage Labor, spelled the American way for you, for you European. Um, and, and I also really want to flag here um, an, another event that we have starting just this Tuesday, so the 19th of May. We'll be having uh, an, an e-discussion, which is essentially, for those of you who are less familiar with e-discussions, essentially it's, a, it's an online forum. It, it'll be open. Um, it's actually going to go on multiple weeks. We'll have, um, you see the various tracks here that we have each week. It's an open online forum. You are all very welcome to join. There's a lot of really complex, um, complex issues and complex implications um, that, um, that uh, that Bernd has already explored today and that I think a lot of us wrestle with um, on the implementation side when we really start to think about, well, what does this really mean for me, uh, me and my programs, the populations that I'm working with, the donor priorities that I'm responding to, um, the, the, the teams that I have to work with, the experience that I have. We have a really great lineup of, um, of experts from a variety of, um, from both sort of the implementation side as well as academics, as well as um, USAID and DFID. We've got a great lineup of really experienced people um, with a lot to contribute to this issue. And so I really encourage you to sign up for this, uh, for this e-consultation. It starts on Tuesday. Um, you can log in in the morning, throw a, throw a viewpoint out there, a question, something you're wrestling with, come back in at the end of the day and, and see what this community of, um, the community of, um, of um, development practitioners and, and researchers have been able to add to your understanding and to your knowledge and what you can share from your own experience um, that can inform, um, can inform um, the, the general knowledge of, of the community as well as the direction that um, projects and, and agencies uh, like USAID or DFID um, move in as they, as they kind of um, explore this area as well. So the link is right there at the top of your page. It's also on the Beam Exchange uh, website. Lastly, um, again, the full report um, on the evidence review of a stock taking, which is really just the first step um, in Leo's work in this area. We recognize, this, recognize there's many steps um, to, to go, but this is really the first step. That full report is available on microlinks. The infographic that Bernd put up at the very beginning is a really great visual to print off, share with your team, bring it to your next staff meeting, put it on your wall and use that to sort of start a conversation with people um, and get, get some of those juices, uh, juices flowing. Um, for those of you who are active on social media, our, our younger crowd, um, hashtag wage work matters is a way to kind of draw some connections um, um, between work uh, or thoughts um, that you have that you want to share on Twitter. Lastly, um, USAID has a market systems blog um, on microlinks, and all this past month they've been devoting, all of um, April, they've been devoting it to the topic of labor. So there's a lot of really great posts, really easy to kind of digest, um, short little snippets, um, talk about a lot of different issues and, that are um, sort of uh, launching points from, a, from the foundation of, um, of labor markets and our poverty reduction agenda. So I encourage you to check that out there as well. 
with that, um, I want to get to the first question from, uh, from Gordon Freer that came up a little bit earlier, and that's around the question of mechanization, which is something that a lot of our projects in some form or another are encouraging. Um, Gordon says, we're involved in a rural agricultural mechanization project, and we're interested in assessing the displacement of wage labor as a result of the introduction of things like tractors. Do you have any suggestions for things that we need to be aware of or guard against? All right, thanks a lot. Um, first of all, maybe to look at the first part of that question and then the relation between smallholder farmers and their hiring in or out of wage labor. And then actually that's an important point and then maybe I should have made that a bit clearer. Um, of course, we're not talking here about either wage labor or farmers or micro-entrepreneurs, not at all. This is uh, a much more symbiotic relationship. And of course, uh, a lot of smallholder farmers do actually employ um, wage labor. And this is really important. This is a really important form of employment in rural areas. Um, so this doesn't necessarily mean actually that we have to revolutionize all of our intervention mechanisms. Some of them might actually already be quite employment uh, intensive, but probably we, we are not aware of that and we're not focusing on it that way. And then it means that probably we lose uh, out on a lot of uh, labor effects. On the other hand, of course, if we look at smallholder farmers, there are a lot of there also the range is very large between larger and smaller smallholder farmers and it tends to be the medium to larger uh, size farmers um, uh, who, who employ wage labor. So that is really important. So it might change really who we are actually targeting in our market systems uh, development approach. In terms of mechanization, um, well, <laughs> I don't have an easy answer to that. But, uh, especially because I don't think there are that many studies yet, in, in, in especially in the African context, because the mechanization is still very low. It, it, I think it really depends on the type of agriculture enterprise then. So there might be actually quite well mechanized and then capital intensive production techniques, which at the same time also employ a lot of labor. Um, so it depends. Maybe, and then this does, could also be Per land, it depends really on the sector and the value chain. That was what I'm trying to bring across. If, of course, we suddenly start um, employing uh, one tractor driver on on a plot of 50 hectares, whereas that before was probably 10 or more small-scale farmers and their families, that might be a problem. But it needn't be necessarily because around around that work, around let's say that tractor that needs to be uh, maintained and so on, a lot of other jobs suddenly start to appear, maybe be it security workers and so on and so forth. So, so the question is, does that really reduce employment on that land? And, and it really is very context specific, but I don't think the immediately intuitive answer of yes, it does reduce labor employed on that land is necessarily the, the right one. And actually, we have a section of the report really detailing not as much, not so much in mechanization terms, but in general, uh, whether we really should be afraid of promoting labor because it might have a decreasing impact on, on, on competitiveness. And then the outcome was actually it might not be as straightforward as people often think. Thanks. That's a that's a great question, and I and I would um, I think that's a really that's a, probably a very common um, common question that a lot of us on the sort of ag development side face. It'd be a great question to throw out there and have some really rich discussion in the broader community at the e discussion on um, on Tuesday. Another question came in from Lorenz Wild. Um, he says, and this is a this is a this is a good one. It's a challenging one. Realistically, how different will our interventions be if based on market systems development now that we know that rural wage labor contributes more to household income than previously assumed? How, how, uh, what are some of the changes maybe that, that we might expect to see in how we do our work? Will we not continue to work on strengthening the system in a facilitative manner with the goal of increasing farm level capacity or output, which in turn increases wage opportunities? I guess this sort of gets to that question of where um, I know this is something that in the structural transformation week 
of the e-consultation is, is something a lot of the experts that we have on board have been working very heavily in um, for, the, for their careers, really, but sort of where, where does investment go? Does investment stay in ag? Do we invest in manufacturing? Um, and what are some of the implications in terms of the focus of our investment and what those kind of multiplier effects are? Sure, thank you very much. Uh, it is a very good question, I agree. Um, I would actually argue that the implications are significant um, because we sh the assumption that just by investing in a market, by promoting business of any sort, be it agriculture or others, does automatically also have huge employment effects is not warranted. Let me give you one example. We, there was this... Uh, large-scale study, and I quoted some of the figures from that, uh, on fair trade. You might have seen that. Those were the figures I um, sh uh, showed on Uganda and Ethiopia. Now, fair trade, you would, assu you would assume, actually has a, has, well, it has, first of all, the certification process has a strong labor component in theory, and you would assume by supporting farmers and getting better wages, that also would trickle down to wage workers. Well, in fact, what we found is it's not that easy. And then this study had a strong impact by showing that the employment outcomes on fair trade farms compared to non-fair trade farms were actually worse. So um, this is not an automatic process at all. And just by saying we focus on any business or any type of farmer that will have empl good employment outcomes, I think is a bit too, uh, too simplistic. Now, at the same time, saying that, it, it doesn't mean that, of course, we stop promoting business, far from it, or we stop uh, promoting farming. But we need to be much more selective in how we target that, and we need to think much more about the employment uh, implications. It also would, for example, mean that we might have to focus a bit more on larger scale uh, businesses and then farms. Um, or let's also say medium scale, so but but not just the poorest smallholder farmers, because they might not be the ones who create that sort of employment. In fact, they might be quite in, uh, uncompetitive in the market, and and might be actually better off becoming uh, uh, wage workers in the medium to short term. So again, I think we really need to target the right sectors and the right sectors and the right type of interventions within the market to be sure that we actually have these. Uh, positive wage outcomes or wage employment outcomes, which I don't think are, are automatic in any way. Thanks. Um, and I just noted a, a question from Diana um, about the links to the slide. So you'll see that SEEP network um, in your Q&A, you'll see that they did send the, um, I guess it's not clickable in this thing either. So. Um, you might, it's not too hard just to, to type that into your screen if you want to get the links to the report or the e-discussion. Sorry, sorry about that. The, the slides will be available online on Monday. Um, so another question from Mike Klassen. Can you provide a more specific example, maybe just briefly, about what it means to tighten labor markets and how taking that insight into account might change the strategy of a market systems intervention? At what scale do you mean to close the gap of supply? And demand. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, I specifically and quite consciously put that element in the so-called macro level uh, factors, knowing full well that this, these are, let's say, uh, large, larger effects that are not that easy to bring about uh, for us in our work when we talk about problems or projects. But this also might be something that we should do together with policy work and so on and so forth. Um, that said, I think we can have a tightening effect. One, one very simple example would be to try and reduce child labor in a particular sector. So part of the in intervention might be to, to come up with a, uh, a schooling program to bring children back in school, into school and encourage uh, rural communities to send children to school. Now that will automatically have a tightening effect on the labor market. Um, the same could be for elderly who actually still work until, well, more or less the, the last days or months they actually can, whereas, in fact, probably you might say from a social pers perspective they shouldn't and we wouldn't want them to work. Uh, instead, what we could do is introducing a care system where 
on the one hand that creates jobs for care workers and the other hand it withdraws elderly who actually we wouldn't want having to work uh, from the labor market and who need to be replaced with other workers. So these are, might be uh, some ways of how this can be done. Again, another important thing is to focus on labor-intensive employment intensive sectors. So if we promote those, we know that creates a lot of employment and that automatically will increase demand for labor and will have an upward drive on also labor conditions. Um, if we can uh, connect our interventions with some sort of conditionality of what sort of, uh, let's say, like a minimum standard of the employment conditions that should be in place with these jobs created, that would, of course, be so the better. Um, and yeah, it, sorry, just just a final sentence. And in, in, in terms of the scale, um, I think any contribution we can do to that would be positive. So whether we can do it only in a small but the larger we go, of course, the better, very clearly. Okay. Um, and we're going to get to a couple more questions here before before the end, but I wanted to just hand it over to, um, to Lucho Osorio from, from, um, from MAFI and BEAM and, and just give you a, a quick opportunity, Lucho, to, to reflect a little bit on, on what you feel like um, – what you feel like this means for the sort of market development crowd that's so active in, in Mafia and Beam. Anna. And thanks, Bern, for a great presentation, very stimulating. Um, I think for me the most important thing is uh, that this is a piece in, in the puzzle of market development that really uh, – forces us to to change our game in many in many different aspects I mean the questions that have been coming through um, show that um, there are very important issues that we need to reflect about related to for example the role of technology um, the role of governments and the awareness that they should have when it comes to understanding wage workers and the uh, labor market systems um, for example, what Bernd said about the importance of schooling programs and um, um, safety nets um, and support programs for the elderly uh, mean that the government um, must play a big role in these uh, efforts that um, we want to undertake when it comes to developing a certain market system in a particular subsector. Um, so that, uh, that means that we need to work as a community of practice, I, I would say globally and nationally, of course, uh, to make sure that the governments uh, are more aware of this they, and, and the nuances and the realities of, of these workers are clearer to them. Uh, it seems that the, the national statistics and the data that's coming through that is uh, supporting their policy making are not really showing the reality of, of uh, these people, and therefore the potential to contribute to market development is, uh, is not uh, maximized. And the other thing I wanted to say is, uh, um, I have received a couple of messages from different people about this uh, concern that um, the, the question is, uh, if we focused on, on these issues of wage workers and labor markets, does it mean we need to stop working with the, with the farmers, with the smallholder farmers? And I think that's been already um, mentioned that, uh, on the contrary, what is really important here is to, uh, for us as, as market development practitioners, to be aware that these actually uh, represent um, subsystems that we need to start connecting much better. So I'm going to leave it there because I want to uh, give more time for uh, the participants' questions. But I think what is uh, really clear here in this um, in this Q and A is that um, we need more time to discuss about this as a community of practice and, and, and researchers as well. And I, I hope that people will use the opportunity of uh, the next weeks, starting on the 19th of May, to engage. Uh, with each other and to explore more in depth many of these uh, fascinating issues. Thanks, Anna. Sure. Thanks, thanks, Lucho. And I, I think for me too, one of the big things I take away from this is just really taking some of the implications for our causal 
causal logic and our sort of results chains and really um, um, really some 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 challenging um, challenging implications for the logic um, and the strength of the logic as it relates to poverty reduction and who and who that who that really sort of target group is and and what are the um, what are those sort of links in that causal change that really do drive sustainable poverty reduction? And maybe we've jumped a little too quickly to kind of a farming-based pathway, pathway out of poverty. And so one of the big takeaways for me is really um, really challenging and kind of doing some critical analysis around, around that leap that we often make. Um, so I'm going to go back to another uh, another question, which relates to the kind of gender implications. Amanda Muscal um, says one of the implications you mentioned is to focus on women, youth, and migrant workers. Obviously, three um, sort of extremely broad categories of of, um, of populations. Um, but she's asking particularly about um, women. Can you speak any more on any gender differentiation that you found in in your data? Um, right. Thanks a lot. Yes, certainly. And then, first of all, apologies if if I wasn't able to to cover uh, all the in gender issues in detail and, and or use and migrant is migration issues, uh, and they deserve a lot more detail. That's for sure. But time was constraining there. But I mean, in our work before, both in the report but also previous research, we did focus on the gender dimension a lot, and it's really crucial within um, labor markets labor markets in general. First of all, a lot of the tasks or the activities or jobs within the labor market are very, let's say, genderized. So, so some are uh, maybe for cultural reasons or, or any other might be dominated by men and others by women. And then we need to be very aware of that and then the impacts is that. Beyond that, I think a really important thing that we need to do is to have an understanding of um, inter-household or intra-household relationships and how women might, for example, systematically be excluded from the labor market because of power relations within communities, within the households that um, bind them in some form or other to the, to the, to the family farm of some sort and then the husband maybe not allowing them to enter the labor market and earn some money, or if they do, that they do not have uh, control over the income derived there. So there are really important issues there. Again, so that really goes hand in hand with a lot of the gender work that, that we are doing, that has been done, and I should continue, of course, and in, well, on the one hand, empower, empowering women to allow them to enter the labor market, um, but also to, to create the, the right type of opportunities for them. So, yes, very important for sure. Okay, great. And um, I'll just ask one last question from um, Kuranjan Kujar, um, and then we'll wrap up. He's asking, is there evidence from the study that suggests which landholder farmers, obviously this would be very context-specific, but maybe in either in uh, sort of in general or in a specific context, which landholder farmers are more inclined towards wage labor? I mean, what are some of those characteristics? And who are some of the major wage providers and employers maybe that, that, uh, uh, that implementers would want to be kind of um, coordinating or, or targeting with when they're developing intervention strategies. Um, all right, thank you. I can't find the question here, but uh, okay. Uh, I assume when you mean landholder farms, you, you're um, alluding to the size of the farm. And uh, it goes without saying that the larger farm, the, the higher the reliance on, on hired labor rather than family labor. So, and then I showed that and then the data is quite um, clear on that is larger agriculture can create a lot of wage labor and then scale matters in terms of employment effects. Of course, we have to be careful there. Uh, the, it is important that the land is used efficiently, that um, really the, the sort of techniques that are employed are labor intensive and it's not just idle land where you have uh, just a few workers on um, many, many hectares. So, so it has to be very controlled for. 
There are specific sectors that are labor-intensive. Again, I mentioned the flower sector as a really good example in Ethiopia, where in a very short amount of time, uh, a very competitive sector sprung out and has created a lot of employment, particularly for women, in the majority actually for women. Other examples are short cycle uh, sectors, be it, for example, life, uh, livestock, small ruminants, which are very labor intensive, but also horticulture. We can have with irrigation systems um, several seasonal cycles in a year, more than just with rain fed agriculture, and that is very labor intensive. So, a lot of jobs there can be created also because those are usually high value crops. So again, it really depends on the context where you're working, but there are a lot of opportunities out there. Plus, I think we should also look a bit beyond agriculture within the rural context. So there are a lot of other rural jobs or in peri-urban uh, settings and tertiary uh, towns and so on, where, where there might be a lot of construction jobs and other jobs in the non-farm uh, economy that we should be aware of and we should consider uh, promoting. Thanks. So with that, we have um, we've reached our, our time. I want to be respectful of everyone's schedules. We really appreciate, appreciate all of you joining. We had a great turnout. We hope to see all of you on, um, on Tuesday at the, on, the, on the forum. Um, please feel free to, uh, to let us know if you have any challenges registering. Um, and uh, we'll continue some of these questions. Perhaps maybe we'll post some of these to get discussion going uh, on, on the e-discussion on Tuesday and, and put that out to a broader, broader community. So thanks again. And, and we hope that this is really the first of many conversations. I think, uh, I think there's a, this is, uh, for me at least, I see, I see wage labor um, becoming there's a lot of momentum around this issue. There's a lot of energy, I think, um, in the sort of market development crowd around really starting to, to think about how this applies to our work and how we can leverage um, market systems approaches to, to, to work, uh, work in different ways, to work in different systems. Um, and uh, it's an exciting area where there's a lot of space for innovation and creativity. Um, so thanks very much, and we look forward to talking with all of you again on Tuesday. Thank you very much, also from my side. I hope it was useful. Likewise. Thanks a lot, everyone. Goodbye, and hope to see you next week.